This is the R Podcast, Episode 7, Best Practices for Workflow Management. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the R Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Nance, and this is the podcast that's aimed at users who are new to statistical computing with learning how to use the powerful, powerful statistical computing package called R. And right off the top, I realized that this episode has been a long time coming, to say the least. I've unfortunately was quite delayed in getting this episode out. It was actually due to a combination of things, one of which is a pretty critical component to my uh, computer setup here at the our podcast studios, if you will. Um, had a bit of a failure, and this was actually closely intertwined with um, a set of software that I actually talked about in a previous episode. In fact, it was probably the last episode when we were talking about importing data, and I used this um, software called Myth TV, which heck, you can think of it as like an open source version of TiVo. Well, basically, without getting into too much gory details here, the device I used to actually record the TV straight from my cable feed, it's a little kind of USB type recording device called an HD PVR. Well, it just so happened one day it was not recording anything and I was going trying to figure out why and did a whole bunch of troubleshooting and then in one of the troubleshooting steps it turns out that the thing just basically completely fried itself and is now a uh, nice door door uh, how should I say a uh, door stop if you will because it's not doing anything and um, so I went, it took a while to troubleshoot that and I have a replacement now in my hand it's a different type of device but I need a little help from the cable company to activate it. But basically that was taking up a bunch of time and then combined with some other projects at work that for whatever reason were coming up that needed to be done. It just so happened I wasn't able to get to this until this week. But um, my apologies for that. And I'm definitely trying my best to get back to our regular release cycle of at the latest every other week for each new episode. So for those of you who were, you know, some of you were kind enough to send me some words, kind of asking, hey, where, where'd you go? Hope you come back. And I'm definitely not going away. I'm going to definitely be doing this podcast for hopefully a very long time. But just so happened, just some ebbs and flows for various factors kind of prevented this episode from getting out when I wanted to. But anyway, good news is we're back at it. And um, I think I got some nice content for this episode that we can talk about. But first, I wanted to lead off with a couple of announcements, both from the R community perspective and also from the site's perspective. First, I'll talk about the R podcast site itself. In this little downtime, as I was you know, getting finished with that hardware problem, I was imp- trying to implement a new feature for the R podcast website, and I think I finally got it up and running. And that is actually some forums. And I wanted to build this into the R Podcast website because obviously, you know, with a podcast, I really enjoy hearing from all of you listeners. And I've definitely received some great feedback via email. And I, I sound like a broken record, but I'm always also looking for some nice audio feedback as well. But anyway, back to the point at hand, some of the other successful podcasts I listen to also have user forums where the listeners can interact with each other and I can also you know interact with all of you as well for various topics whether it's about specific episodes or even just general discussion about R. So I have set up these forums and you can find them if you go to the main website for this uh, podcast called www.r-podcast.org you'll see there's a new tab under the header or the banner, if you will, and it says forums. 
And if you just click on that right off the top, you'll take you'll be taken to like the portal of the various forms that we have online. And I've set up some pretty um, general type forms where I have actually a category called general and I'll, I have some specific sub forms for like site announcements and other types of announcements and those will come from me directly you know to announce either some new things going on with the site maybe a new feature or even if I have like hardships like I had the past few weeks I'll make an announcement on there as well so you guys can kind of keep up to date with what's happening on, on my side of things but then I also have uh, form specific to the podcast itself where I'll have a post in one of the categories for each our podcast episode and this is another great way if you want to join the site as a forum participant then you could leave some feedback directly on say that topic for that particular episode I also have some uh, sub forms dedicated to talking about R itself and I'll preface this by saying that I'm not certainly I'm not trying to compete with any of the established forums for R, whether it's the mailing list or my personal favorite, the um, the stackoverflow.com set of you know question and answer forms with specific questions for R. This is not meant to be on that level. This is just more of a you know meant to be a general discussion about R itself. You know we we'll also have you know if you want to share some tips if you will some nice things you've learned along the way i have a subcategory for that as well but i just thought this would be a nice feature to um hopefully enhance even more the interaction i have with all of you the listeners out there so i would definitely invite you to check those out and if you're interested just go ahead and have a quick registration um it's very straightforward and then i look forward to kind of interacting with all of you on that level as well so and one thing I'll also say is that um, you may have been able to tell by the website itself, as much as I've done my best to make it look you know, clean and pretty, um, I'm definitely not a web designer by trade, even though I've done a little bit here and there just with some specific projects in grad school. But if you see anything on the forms when you're browsing to it that looks completely out of place, maybe the page just didn't render right, just send me a quick email, you know, you know the address, it's uh, the rcast at gmail.com, and I'll be sure to take a look and fix it. I think I solved all the issues, and there were quite a bit that I, when I was trying to import this uh, forum software, but I think I got it under control now. But like I said, I may have missed something, you know, please let me know if you see something that you know, isn't rendering right or just even a question about the forms itself, I'll be glad to help. Um, so that was by far the biggest uh, update with the site itself. And hopefully, like I said, the forms will be, you know, a very useful feature that all of you will like to use. Next, I'll touch on some recent developments in the R community, and they actually have to do with the IDE called R Studio that I have talked about in previous episodes back in the early episodes well they just had a release of version 0.96 recently and you know they've had some releases in the past that I even in my mind have thought hey this could really change the way a lot of us interact with R because they implemented some really good features before this release I remember there was a previous release that implemented what's called version control and I'll be touching on that actually in the main topic coming up later. But in this release, I feel like they've taken an equal step you know, ahead in really enhancing the, the use of R Studio and you know, working with R itself. Well, in previous versions of R Studio, they had you know, ways that you could actually compile what's called a sweeve document. And I realize we haven't talked much about what Sweeve is in the previous episodes. But rest assured, I have a whole set of episodes like already kind of planned out that I'm going to be talking about a more global topic called reproducible research in which we'll touch on a lot of technical details of how this thing works. Well, to get to the update of our studio, they have now implemented a direct interaction 
with another R package that some have called Sweeve on steroids or just a more optimal version of Sweeve. That package is called Knitter. That's spelled K-N-I-T-R. And this package has been released for a few months now, but this, in, in my mind, I have no problem saying this, this is an absolute game changer in reproducible research because it gives the user the flexibility to create what are called these reproducible, you know, our research scripts, usually coded in what's called a SWE format, but now you can make these reports into different type of formats besides the standard LaTeX format. And in particular, there's a new, newer format called Markdown that now this package has a direct linkage to producing reports in that format. And now our studio can directly translate some of these special files you create in what's called our Markdown format into an HTML page basically on the fly. So I realize a lot of this is probably brand new material to a lot of the listeners out there, but this is absolutely huge for reproducible research, especially with R. And I've started to experiment with Markdown a little bit. I have a lot to learn, but I'm practicing a bit with some of my research projects and even with stuff for the R podcast itself, especially as I get to those reproducible research topics. But this version of our studio now directly interacts with that knitter package and it just makes things a lot more automated and just frankly a lot easier for someone who's brand new to all this like stuff about Sweeve or Knitter, you know, LaTeX, Markdown, whatever have you. This makes it, I think, the learning curve a lot more gentle for somebody who's brand new to this to get up to speed with these powerful new features. So you can bet I'm going to be exploring this in a lot more detail relatively soon because I I plan to do a whole series about this because there's no way one episode can cover it all. But I am extremely excited about this and I cannot wait to tap into these new features on a a more in-depth basis. So I'll have a link in the show notes to the post from the RStudio blog that talks about the newer features in this release. And actually, even since that post, they've had a couple of little minor releases just to either fix a bug or add something else to it. But this is exciting stuff, and I really can't wait to explore this some more. So with that, I'll get to one of our pieces of listener feedback. Message for you, son. Okay, so I have one piece of listener feedback this week, and that comes from Charlie, who wrote to the R podcast uh, actually before in a, in a previous episode. Charlie writes, and he actually gives a link to a website called The Cookbook for R. And he, he writes, have you seen the site at the above link? If not, you may want to take a look. I have enjoyed your podcast. Hope you keep them up. Well, thanks, Charlie. And this this uh, website, once again, it's called The Cookbook for R. And it's written by Winston Chang. And I'll put a link to this in the show notes. And right off the top, this is not to be confused with an actual textbook called The R Cookbook, which is by an excellent textbook, by the way. It's by Paul Teeter. Um, this website is kind of more of a tutorial about R, But here's the kicker is that Winston has put in some really great examples for getting started with that powerful graphical package called ggplot2. And I'm telling you, he's done some really nice examples here. I've actually used them. I've used some of those examples basically verbatim in some of my research projects because they work so well and they deal with the type of data I deal with on on a regular basis. But basically, we're going to cover, you know, visualization in a future episode, and in particular, ggplot2, as I've been using that actually for quite a bit now. I picked it up probably about a year, year and a half ago, and I've come, I've learned a bit along the way, but they recently, as I mentioned in the previous episode, they had an update to the package to version 0.9, 
which gave a lot of useful new features, especially for somebody who's kind of new to the ggplot2 way of, you know, making plots. And, but the R, this uh, cookbook for R, has some really good examples that are kind of what I call plug and play. You can easily adapt them to your data and be up and running with a really innovative, you know, ggplot2 visualization without too much effort. So I would definitely put that in your bookmarks. And it, it, it doesn't just have ggplot2 stuff. It has some nice, you know, basic R kind of tutorial topics as well, especially for like managing data, doing things like group processing, which is a, another thing I'll touch on as we go along. Um, the, there's some really nice examples there. And I think Winston's done an excellent job. So I just wanted to, if he's listening to this, definitely thank you for making this site because it's definitely made you know, my life a lot easier as I've been adapting some new things for R in my research projects. And I, as I said, I really enjoy his uh, ggplot2 examples as well. So definitely check that out. I think you'll, you'll definitely want to bookmark that in your collection of bookmarks about R as you're getting to know how to use R on an effective basis. So that's it for our listener feedback. I think it's time to get to the main topic for today's episode, best practices for workflow management. Okay, so I wanted to take this episode to talk about some of the things that the R community has kind of discussed with, when it comes to managing all the... Um, analyses and that you do with respect to say a project a research project or you know in other words what are some of the best tips or practices for organizing all the you know files or scripts or you know data that you generate or clean or etc within a certain analysis project so to set the stage for this I think as you begin to use R on a more, you know, regular basis, if you're still new to it, you'll learn, you know, obviously that R is capable of doing basically every step of what is needed in a typical analysis, you know, research project. You know, you have your first step of like importing or even generating the data you want to analyze, which as we talked about in episode six, R can handle a lot of ways of importing data and then as another important part of that process is once you have the data especially if you're dealing with real world data you're probably going to have to clean it up in some way so oftentimes you'll write a set of code just to get to the get the data into maybe a usable state or maybe you have to recode some variables or you have to maybe take out some records that shouldn't be there, you know, things like that. That's obviously an important part of a project. And then you have another step, which is when you actually get to the analysis of your data. So maybe you're doing a conventional statistical analysis, maybe like regression or, you know, some basic inference. Maybe it's more in depth than that. And then also a key part of that, of course, is visualizing the data. So you have all that you have to finish up and then how you're going to give these reports or give these results out. Is it just for you or is it, are you doing this in like a consulting role? If so, then you'll definitely have to get those results from your analysis into some kind of report as well. So, you know, whatever, whatever structure that is, it could be anything, but basically that's how I think of a typical project when it comes to R some of those are kind of the typical steps that I deal with on a regular basis. So let's talk about kind of some tips and tricks for how do you kind of get all that under control and how do you like organize that into an easy to use system for your, you know, easy the system for you to follow. So there are a couple of concepts I want to talk about first that deal with R itself that kind of play into what I'll get to when it comes to organization. So first of which is, it's probably a, a bit difficult if you try to put all of these steps of you know importing, cleaning data, your analysis, and then getting output. If you 
if you have a project that has a lot of data or a lot of actual analyses, if you put all this in one type of R, if one particular R script, it could be a lot to deal with. And, and frankly, I used to do this and then it would be so hard to kind of find where, where did I do a certain analysis or, oh, where was that data cleaning? And then if I had to change something, like say I, I, had, I figured out I had to maybe load another data set or I got a more up-to-date data set, I would have to load everything all over again once I changed my script and then run everything all over again, you know, but it was all in one file and it was just getting a little hard for me to keep organized. Well, one feature about R that you'll definitely want to pay attention to is that there is a function called source and the source function, what that does is the only argument you need to supply to it is a path on your file system of whatever you know OS you're running, a path to a particular R script, which of course is your set of you know R code syntax in a dot R file. If you just use the source function on that, then in essence your R session will run all of the code in that file, and then you can do things obviously after that. But it it's a nice function just to try to run something right away that you've already built and you don't want to always have to open that code file up and then highlight if you're like in R Studio, for example, highlight all of that code and then run it. You can use the source function just to get that done. And that works, of course, independent of operating system and independent of whatever GUI or other way of interacting with R that you're using. And then another concept I wanted to talk about is that you can, at any time in your R session, you can save, you know, either some of the objects that you produced, whether it's like data objects or analysis result objects, or even just simple vectors, you know, whatever have you, you can save just maybe a subset of those. Or you can save all of what's ever in your object space or what's more properly defined as your R workspace using either the save function or the save.image function. The save.image function is good if you want to save everything and you don't care about it, or I should say it, it can save everything no matter what the object is. If it's in your workspace, it'll save it. You could also use the save function and then as arguments, you would just put in the names of the particular objects you want to save. So if I had a set of like 20 objects in my workspace and then I only wanted to save like a data file called like data one. And this data file would be more properly defined as say a data frame, for example. Then I could use the save function and just in the first argument put in quotes that name of that object, data one. And then the next argument, I could say file equal, and then just give the name of the R object workspace file, if you will. And then that is something I could then shut down R. And then when I launch R again at a later time, I could use a function called load and then just feed into that the path to that workspace file that I saved back in the previous session. And usually these workspace files end in an extension dot R data, something to that effect. And actually it could be anything, but that's usually what we use to, you know, denote those R workspace files. So the advantage of that is, is that if you did like say some cleaning of data and you had like a clean version of your data that you wanted to save, you could save it into that file and then in a future session, you can just load that workspace file and not have to re, you know, redo all those cleaning steps, or I should say do those again before your analysis because you already did it once. Then you can just get to the actual analysis of that data just by simply loading that R workspace file. So those two concepts, first of which is executing an R script within your R session and then saving and loading 
previous R objects from an external file, those kind of feed into a kind of a proposal that I saw from the stackoverflow.com site on a nice discussion about what were some of the best practices for managing your workflow. And there was a nice post on there that talked about, you know, breaking up your project into, say, four different types of scripts. So I'll put a link in for this uh, post in the show notes. But basically this um, user, his name was Josh Raish, or I hope I'm saying it right. But he said he broke his projects into four different pieces. First of which was a script called load.r, which basically handled the loading or importing of whatever data he was doing, or I should say any data he was analyzing. And typically it would just have those steps of say loading that CSV file or whatever that data was in. And then, you know, depending on the needs of the project, he could then even save an R image file or an R workspace file with that data, that raw data that was loaded into a, a future analysis. So that leads into a second type of file that he recommended called clean.r, which is where all of the um, data cleaning stuff would take place. And depending on the data you're working with, this could either be very little or quite a bit. And I've been on kind of both sides of the fence where I've had data that was you know pretty easy to deal with or to clean up. And then I had data that was absolutely you know, really, really messy, lots of things that needed recoding, you know, some records that just didn't make any sense, you know, all those sorts of things. And then that's where you could put all that code to clean that stuff up into that clean.r file. And then, you know, what you could do in that is that you could, at the end of all that code, you could then save in essence, those clean versions of the data into, say, another R workspace. And then that you could lead, you could use for your actual analysis. So getting back to these um, these pieces of the project that uh, Josh is talking about, he would have a third type of file called func.r, which is basically where you would put all the useful functions that that you would write to actually help with your analysis, you know, put it in that file, and then that would feed nicely into the last piece, of, that last uh, type of file called do.r, which would actually do the actual statistical analysis, visualization, etc. But remember that uh, command I talked about called source? Well, you could source that, that uh, function file before you get to your analysis, because then, in essence, you would have loaded those functions that you created into your, your session, and then be able to use those just as if you're using functions from a package after you know loading the package via the library function. It's the same kind of thing. But that way, what's nice about a setup like that is that if you're working with a lot of data, and you maybe have to make a change in maybe the cleaning step or the loading step or something like that. You know, the code was kind of organized in such a fashion where it's pretty easy to update maybe a small piece of it. And then just simply running the scripts again would be, you know, a very easy task. And then that would, you know, in essence, have a way for you to organize the project effectively. And as I go on with this, I realize that there's no, the, the best solution is the one that you find is the best solution. What I'm, what I'm saying here are things that I've tried in the past or still do that have helped in my experience. But I invite you to obviously develop the system that works best for you. And that way, you will you know, over time, you know, things in a project will become much easier just because of the system you use for your workflow. So getting back to this, I use this uh, this uh, syntax, or I should say this uh, method of organizing my code for quite a while. And then I would say about a year or so later, I got, I heard about via one of the, maybe our bloggers or one of the blog sites, I heard about a new package for R that kind of aimed to do these type of things, but actually do some of this stuff for you. 
And let me explain a little more detail about that. So there is a, a package called Project Template. And this, this package is written by John Miles White, I believe. And this package was written from, and when I read about the package when it was first developed, the goal of the package was to really help the user automate what may be referred to as the more trivial or maybe mundane parts of a analysis project. And you know what those are, depending on your perspective, maybe you don't really like to do the data cleaning and it's more of a chore, but it's something that you have to do to be able to effectively analyze your data. Well, what's nice about this project template package is that it, right off the bat, it lets you, in essence, create a new project that already has given kind of a nice organizational structure for where you put your code for various tasks. And it even gives you the capability of automating some of these tasks, you know, right off the bat. And then it makes maybe a complex project a lot easier. So I wanted to touch on kind of, in my opinion, the best features of the package and why I use it to this day on a lot of my complex research projects. So this package will actually give you the capability of defining maybe a set of packages that you wanna use in your project and it has a, a configuration file that you can specify certain features and one of them is basically a line that just has what packages do you want loaded when you actually load this specific project into your session. And what's nice about this is you can define this, you know, on a project basis. Maybe one project is more of a visualization project and another project maybe more for say simulation or something totally different. Well, for a particular project, I can have a custom set of packages defined in this you know, configuration file. Then every time I load the project, then those are already loaded right off the bat. Another nice feature is that if you put your data into a subdirectory that it creates appropriate enough called data, let's say you had data in a CSV file, um, you could put your data file into that directory called data. And then when you load this project, it'll actually automatically load the data into your R session. And Project Template actually supports quite a bit of data formats. And I'll put a link in the show notes to the Project Template homepage. And I, I want to compliment John on setting up this website because it really helps you get up to speed with using Project Template, perhaps for the first time. And then as you get familiar with it, he's got sections that are for more advanced usages and some really, you know, nice documentation. And I'm really a big fan of the authors of these packages that really take the time to put a lot of documentation via a website or a Vignet or whatever have you. It just makes getting to know those packages a lot easier. And I think John's done an excellent job with Project Template. So like I was, I was saying earlier, this uh, project template package supports all sorts of different data types. In fact, it even supports like SQL files. It supports a lot of text delimiting files. It supports even files that are located online as well. And I can't begin to exhaustively list all of those, you know, verbally, but definitely check the website out. And if there's a data file, chances are it supports it in some way. And another cool feature about it is that it sets up a directory into your, your project directly, directory, and it's called Munge. And it's kind of a funny word for it, but it's appropriate because this is where if you, you could put a script, an R script into this Munge directory, and this is actually the code that you would use to clean whatever data you're importing. And this is really cool because then What's nice is when you load the project, it'll not only load the data for you, but then if you give it a flag to basically munge or clean the data, it'll run these cleaning scripts already for you when you load the project. 
In other words, you didn't even have to type source and whatever the name of your script is to munch the data. The project template package will do all that for you. This has been a really helpful feature to me because a lot of times my projects will have more than one data file, hence I'll have to clean more than one data file. And then once I do it once and set this up into that specific directory, then all I have to do is just load the project, the project from the project template package and then it'll actually run all these scripts for me and then I'll have like the clean set of data ready for me to analyze. And getting another nice feature that it can implement is that it comes built in with a function called cache. And what cache does is you could put this at the end of like one of your data cleaning scripts so that let's say I was cleaning a data frame that I loaded from like a CSV file and I finished that up in that munch script and then at the end of that munch script I could put a, a reference to the function cache just put the name of that data file and then what it will do is it will save a workspace of that clean data you know into a directory called appropriate enough cache C-A-C-H-E and then what's cool is that in the future when I load the project as long as that cache data file had the same name as that raw data file, the project template package will first check to see if that raw data file had what's called a cached version of it. And if it does, it'll just load that cached version. And it won't even bother loading the raw data anymore because you already cleaned it up. So that's really cool is that you can save these like clean versions of the data that are optimal for your statistical analysis relatively automatically once you, you know, develop a munch script that does the cleaning. And those are those are actually probably my favorite features of the project template package right off the bat is that it gives you those capabilities of doing it in a very much an automated way. It also has a directory called when you set up a project that will give you a directory called lib which is where you would want to put like say all the custom functions you created that you want to use in your analysis but you don't really want to always have to put like the function code along with your actual say analysis code you could keep your functions into this lib area and then project template will automatically import whatever those functions are into your session much like how it imports data automatically so once you set it up, it'll be ready for you every time you load the project from that point on. And then it also has some nice directories, even if you want to write code that's what's called testing code. And this may be something where if you're doing a simulation or something and you want to do like a test of your simulation, you might want to put your code there because it can also interact with a package called test that that's actually written by Hadley Wickham of the ggplot2 fame and it can directly hook into that package to do you know some custom testing for whatever R script you're doing and I'm not going to get into the details about that because to be honest I haven't done a lot of testing other than when I wrote a package you know about a year and a half ago I don't really do a lot of testing for my analysis routines but if you did you might want to check out that feature as well Lastly, it'll just put a lot of other directories that are useful and even a directory called reports that might be useful if you want to, say, generate maybe uh, what's called a markdown report or like a LaTeX report using, you know, those packages like Knitter or Sweeve or whatever have you. Um, it would, yeah, it's like a nice place to put all that as well. But this, this package actually, this project template package has been really helpful for me as I've gotten more complex research projects. And I had, you know, up to that point, I had a pretty hard time of organizing everything and keeping track of maybe things that were, you know, functions from analysis routines, from cleaning data, et cetera, et cetera. It kind of gave me a nice workflow to at least start from and now it's become kind of second nature to me that every time I have a new project, I immediately load up the project template package and then I create a project 
and then that automatically gives me all those directories and all those hooks to start automating the various parts of the project that you know you once you do it once you don't want to always have to keep thinking about it so it kind of gives you a nice way of automating all those things so that was that was the package I wanted to talk about a lot in this episode I do want to touch on another concept before we close out the topic and that actually is as you're working on a project oftentimes you may have to make changes you know to certain analyses you know certain you know functions or even perhaps you get an updated set of data and you know but up to maybe about a few months ago I never really thought about the concept of version control with like a project that I'm using R with for like a statistical analysis. Up to, like I said, a few months ago, I kind of equated version control with more of like software development. You know, people who make like the Firefox browser or whatever. I'm sure they have some version control or something. So if something breaks, they can go back to something and then figure out what, what went wrong and have a stable, you know, reset button almost. Well, what's interesting is that there's been some more discussion, especially lately, about, you know, it's important as well for us who are doing statistical analysis with a software like R, which, of course, has got an emphasis on writing scripts, you know, programming style scripts. But up to this point, it's been kind of weird to think about using version control in that setting. Well, there was a great discussion on Stack Overflow about kind of what are the ways we could implement version control for like a data analyst, you know, or a statistician, whatever you want to call it. And with that said, there were some nice, you know, discussion points in that post, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes, about using version control systems like Git or Subversion. And I, I read the discussion and I thought, well, this sounds pretty cool, but how do I really do it? Well, I touched on it back in the beginning of this episode, but recently our studio has now features in place that directly interact with either Git or Subversion for version control of your R code. And now I think it's to the point where once you get either of those version control systems set up, it's quite easy now to actually start using version control for like your R project analysis, you know, files. So I've, it took me a while to learn it and I'm not an expert quite yet, but I do feel like I have a bit of, you know, a bit of understanding now, especially when it comes to Git. Git actually is what's used by the repository I use online for the code of my previous podcast. That site, of course, is called GitHub. And actually, when I signed up for GitHub, they actually put some nice tutorials on there to actually help you install Git on your OS of choice, whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux. And so if you're brand new to the concept of version control, you know, I still think you should definitely check out, you know, Git and Subversion. And they're actually more than just that. You know, take a look at each of those and see what's right for you. I'll just say from my perspective, it seems like Git is the easier one to kind of get up to speed with. And thanks to GitHub, you know, if nothing else, even if you're not interested in actually using GitHub for sharing any code, I would check out their documentation because they do have some nice tutorials for getting Git installed onto your system. And that would be important because once you have it installed, then when you launch R Studio and you, you know, use a new feature that R Studio has called Appropriate Enough Projects, you could then create a project and then you could automatically add the hooks for version control of whatever files you create using Git. And so I would definitely check that out if you're interested in, you know, having version control on your code and just from my perspective, that's very useful to me because let's say I had a client I was working with and they wanted me to do another visualization or another, you know, analysis. And I ended up changing a file, but then I realized, 
Well, I don't really like the way I did that. I wish I could go back to what I had before. And Git will give me that capability of restoring a previous state of a file relatively easily. And then not only that, but when I make changes, I can do something that's called a commit. And then I can actually type, you know, in this commit for all the files I changed, kind of what was my thinking around that. And so in other words, it's kind of like when you update, if you have a blog or you read blogs, you always see there's an update for whatever new content. It's kind of like you're giving yourself that update of what you changed. And you can always kind of have like a running history of your development or whatever our code you've used for a project. And then you can kind of get into your mindset of what, what you did before. And maybe if you need to go back again and change something. So this to me, version control now is finally getting to the point where I think it's more readily, how should I say it? It's easy to use now than maybe it was say a couple of years ago for somebody, especially like me who, you know, I have somewhat of an IT background from my college days, but I'm certainly not a software developer by profession. So version control just seemed like such a kind of other concept that I couldn't really grasp. But now with these advances and things like our studio, and then also the resources around like Git and Subversion, I think it's to the point where now statisticians, data analysis, whatever you want to call it, can really start using these principles to really help their management of whatever files they create for a particular project. So that was kind of my two cents on, you know, some best practices for managing a workflow for your R project, whatever it happens to be. And I'd be really interested to hear from all of you what tips and tricks you have that have really enhanced your productivity or your management of a particular project. Obviously, there is so many solutions to this. And of course, the best solution is the one that works best for you. So I'm, but I, at the same time, I definitely like to hear what other people are doing. And it just gives me, if nothing else, a more broad background of what other great concepts there are for managing your particular projects and your analyses. So definitely, you know, drop me a line, as I said, to either my email, of course, at the rcast at gmail.com. Or go ahead and utilize the new forums if, if you want. You can directly reply to the post I have in the R podcast sub forum of where this particular episode. I definitely would enjoy hearing from you. And of course, I'll say once again, I'm definitely looking forward to hopefully getting some audio feedback from all of you very soon. And you can leave that. Either you can record your audio clip on your own setup you know, just use whatever microphone you have and whether it's your laptop microphone or whatever else. And then just, you know, you know, record a short clip, save it in like an MP3 or AUG format and just send it to me directly to, to the, the, um, pod, the rcast at gmail.com and I'll be sure to play it on the air. And you can also utilize our Google voicemail line um, and you can get to the number on, on the R podcast site. And that number is plus one, two, six, nine, eight, four, nine, nine, seven, eight, zero. And I definitely look forward to hearing from all of you, hopefully um, with some audio feedback. But of course, all of your feedback is obviously very much appreciated. And please definitely uh, stay subscribed to the our podcast site, whether it's from iTunes or from our direct um, RSS feeds in the MP3 or OGG format. And like I I said earlier, I hope you you like the new forums and definitely check them out and just let me know what you think. Even if you don't like them at all, just let me know. I'm I'm interested to to hear what all of you have to say. Um, So I think that's going to wrap it up for today's episode. As usual, I end up going longer than I anticipate, but I just have a lot of of things I want to share with all of you. So um, anyway, I hope it's been a good discussion and... Thanks a lot for listening. Until next time. End of line.